Welcome to Dance to Heal. I'm your host, Jenny C. Cohen. Join me as I share stories of how dance and movement can bring healing in a way that is safe and tailored to your life. I'm a cancer survivor, mother of two, and an award-winning performer who found that movement was vital to my recovery. I created Dance to Heal Wellness and also authored the best-selling book, Outside in Recovery, Dancing My Way Back to Myself After Breast Cancer. I will bring new techniques to help you on your dance journey and healing path. Are you ready to move? Dance to Heal starts now. Eric DeRosa, founder and CEO of From Survivor to Thriver, is a mental health advocate, speaker, author, and co-host of the From Survivor to Thriver podcast. He aims to normalize discussions around mental health topics and remind his audience that they are not alone. There is strength in community, and it's perfectly okay to not always be okay. So welcome, welcome, Eric. I am so honored. We both went to the same college. So did his amazing wife and my husband's. Please, please, please welcome. Welcome to the podcast, Eric. Hi, Jenny. Thank you so much for having me from across the border (laughs) in Utah. (laughs) As I sit here in Colorado, a couple of judges, not judging people, but judges as in our collegiate mascot always i always found that such a bizarre i mean i get that like louis brandeis was a supreme court judge but i was like judges can't we have like something cool can't we have a football team can't we can't we be like the other schools (laughs) meanwhile i'm like i would love just to have a cool mascot like a cat yeah, like a, yeah, something that's like that is fun that people can relate to. Yeah, like a cat, like a lion, like a a tiger, like some sort of yeah. I know Clemson already has the tigers, but um, just just something like the the judges. It was yeah, <laughs> just so so bizarre. And it's ironic because one of your speaking points and what you what your foundational platform on eric is talking about taboo topics yes right yeah tell us about those taboo topics that we never really talk about and yet it's so essential sure uh biggest taboo topic is mental health uh first and foremost and uh what i've really dedicated my uh, i'm calling this my third act uh so it was uh, 18 years in New York on Wall Street in the finance center and district. And then it was another 12 years here in Colorado teaching skiing. And now act three, as I see it, is all about shattering the stigma around having, as you said, taboo, right? Once thought and still in some circles seen as these taboo topics around mental health and empowering people's voices and i'm trying to com- create this community of thrivers and it's you know all about at its very core changing the message and the messenger around mental health conversations because for far too long when we think about the message right the message is always doom and gloom we we see these pharmaceutical commercials on tv and there's a person and there's this dark thunderstorm cloud following them around and it's raining and and they go into their doctor's office and they have this paper plate that they hold up in front of them with a smile on it with a tongue depressor and and that's the the message that we get right and i always feel like yeah they're the it's a serious topic and and we can look at it sometimes in this serious light but at the end of the day we need to show people that there's hope and that it's not all doom and gloom and that there is help and that it does get better. And when we talk about the messenger, for so long, the messenger's always been doctors, professionals. Uh, you know, now you see a lot of self, uh, self-help self like TikTok gurus out there saying, if you follow these five steps, like you'll be cured, your mental health will be perfectly fine. And the reality is, it's a journey. You and I have talked about this. It's a journey. It doesn't end. It has twists and it has turns. 
And I feel when it comes to the messenger, we as everyday people have that ability to become messengers for positivity and for the importance of speaking about mental health. And, and so for me, it's all about putting all of those things together, putting them in a blender. Uh, and then what comes out is hopefully in time, you, you know, uh, a bit of a tidal wave or a tsunami of people just speaking openly and honestly about this. And I was joking at the beginning, like our, our mascot was the judges and, and my overall why from another classmate of ours, a couple of years younger than me uh, from Simon is all about people being able to speak openly and honestly about their mental health struggles without fear of judgment. I want to speak on something that is super in line with what you're saying, because oftentimes we're not even given permission to pursue, to understand if we even have any issues in the mental health umbrella. So tell us what are some physical and cognitive manifestations of things like anxiety? Sure. Well, and I would, I would even add to that. Mm -hmm. We always think everyone has it all together, right? We see people all from the outside. And for those of us who have struggled for a long time, struggled in silence, uh, we can become masters at being able to hide that. And uh, and so statistically, the numbers are one out of five, so 20% of people, so about 70 million people in the United States will have been diagnosed with some sort of a mental illness, right? According to the DSM-5. The reality is five out of five people we don't have it together. It can be anything from just, you know, feeling off to low grade anxiety to low grade depression. It doesn't have to be an actual diagnosis. From from the anxiety standpoint, uh, you know, a lot of it stems around fear of the unknown, right? Fear of something that will happen in the future and a lot of times it's wired in our childhood. Mm -hmm. And so in our subconscious, in our amygdala, and we live in fight or flight mode. And the longer we live in fight or flight mode, we are prone to living in a world of reactions rather than responses. And mm -hmm. so, yeah, so some of the physical symptoms of that, it can be, um, you know, feeling in many ways like you're having a heart attack. Uh, 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 a lot of people have described to me uh, having what having a panic attack or having an anxiety attack. It can feel as though their heart is about to pound out of their chest. There's a pain in their chest, a heaviness, uh, like somebody's almost sitting on their chest. And so a lot of times people will end up going to the hospital and think they're having a heart attack and they'll be diagnosed with like a panic attack. And uh, eventually, if they follow through with therapy, it'll be some sort of generalized anxiety disorder. Uh, and also, there's pit that sits in your stomach. Um, it, it, it feels as though you really have something in there, like a rock. A friend of mine refers to it as like a rock or a, or a stone. And uh, headaches, very pervasive headaches, not the not the kind that kind of centralize on the front of the head or just from being tired or it's the ones that start from behind your head and kind of go all the way around behind your head to your from ear to ear. Mm -hmm. And it's as though you are in a vice. And the more that you begin to worry, the more if you combine anxiety with uh, obsessive compulsive disorder, the more that vice tends to tighten its grip. The uh, the other one is at when when anxiety is really getting severe, it's as though you're wearing blinders. And and I'm watching you nod, Jenny. Yeah. And it yeah. feels as though the world is starting to close in and you're viewing everything through a tunnel. And what it ends up looking like for me is I don't have the ability to focus. Very simple everyday tasks become a little bit challenging. It's as though my body and my brain are just a bit out of sync. And what I'm trying to do versus what I actually am able to do is just off. And, and at its core for everything is this fear 
of not being safe and secure. And so everyday things that one would go about without any kind of thought leads to kind of just slowing down a little bit, pausing, feeling a little more cautious than you normally would, stepping outside of the house, uh, you know, getting on a bus, getting in a car, and and just having this feeling of being off and and am I safe where I am, right? And and that for me, it's something that I've, you know, I dealt with in silence for 33 years and I live with now. So I use different words. I live with openly. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Um, And there are times when my anxiety is at a zero and there are times when my anxiety can be at a four. Now I have the ability to recognize it. I have my equilateral triangle, my toolbox to be able to work with it. Uh, and I speak about it. I tell people about it. I let people know. I don't hide behind it. And by letting people know, whether it's my therapist or my wife, Amy, or my very close friends, it suddenly gives me a little bit more of a sense of safety and security that other people know. And so in my you know rational slash irrational brain that bounces back and forth during anxious periods, my irrational brain says, oh, because these people know somebody's looking after me, they're aware of what's happening, therefore I will be more safe than I was before I told them. So it's kind of a weird, <laughs> it's a weird cycle and I'm just watching you nod. So I'm I'm guessing you uh, can relate to several, if not all of these types of symptoms. Yes, I can. And I'm hoping our listeners and our watchers on the YouTube video are also nodding. It's insidious. The the effects of unresolved events in our childhood still invade our present lives. It is is it's not recognized, it's not spoken about. It's the old adage of, well, that's just your childhood. You should be over that by now. And people aren't educated enough that it actually is pervasive in our present life, what's happened to your past, until you look at it and figure out in what ways it's still enmeshed in your present life. It's very hard to break out of old patterns. For me, a physical manifestation of anxiety for me and stress and also overlapping with depression has when I don't feel safe, if I'm traveling somewhere, mm-hmm. I will start to, to gain weight. That's a recent discovery this past Interesting. spring. Yes, I went to an event with a mentor who I love and adore, and some of my classmates set up an unsafe environment, and it wasn't addressed. So by the time I got home, I, I couldn't figure out why they took some cool shots of it was a business mentorship. So mm-hmm. they had a photographer come and do photo shoots for you. And I was like, why is this my face look so swollen in these pictures? Like I look bigger. And I'm like, I know, I know photos aren't supposed to let me gain that much weight. And I put myself on a scale and I had gained 10 pounds five days of this event. Wow. That's not normally you all. I don't care how no, much not at right? all. people were joking. Oh, they fed you too much Mexican food. And I'm like, yeah. I understand. I didn't eat that much. Right. Yep. And yes, it was a slightly different altitude. I am in Utah and I was going to Missouri. So it's a different altitude. Yep. It wasn't that. It was the stress I was under because once I recognized, oh my gosh, and I immediately went into my movement and being present and also acknowledging how stressful it was. Yes. Well, and you bring up a really good point. Yeah, It was gone. It was gone within like a few days. And I was like, this is crazy. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. It's such a great point that you bring up because one of the things that happens when, right, whether it's depression or anxiety and our, our body begins to go into this protective mode, this worry mode, our cortisol levels in our body (laughs) <laughs> start to rise. And we go from, uh, you know, some people, like you said, if you're feeling more anxious, some people will eat a little bit less. Other people like may find comfort in food. Um, it's whatever, you know, protective mechanism your body has created for you, but those cortisol levels that are in your body, right. Start to do that to you. And before you know it, you're like, why, like you said, 
why <laughs> did I gain this weight? And so it takes a little bit of time to do that look back and say, oh, yeah, this happened and then this happened. And then I didn't do these things that I should have been doing. You know, interesting, I, I shared this with someone else and I, you, you know, in the realm of you think like I'm the only one. And so I shared this story of when I used to travel uh, for work in New York, when when my anxiety, and, and I'm going to just preface this by saying there's there's general anxiety disorder, which is which is the diagnosis, but then there's PTSD. And uh, underneath the PTSD umbrella, which for me, uh, anxiety is a symptom and it can be in many cases more severe and look different. And so when I was in New York, again, not diagnosed, really, you know, struggling, I would have to go on business trips and there would be times I'd be sitting at the airport and hoping that they would cancel the flight so that I could turn around and go back home. And I could never understand why at all. And this, it was pervasive. I actually was on one flight. Uh, I was sitting in my seat. We were was flying to Buenos Aires for a week of business. Mm -hmm. And we had been on the plane for about an hour and a half. And the captain came on and said, uh, unfortunately, we're not able to fly. Uh, our other pilot is ill and we can't get a replacement crew. So the flight is canceled. And I just remember like how excited I was. <laughs> I texted Amy. I said, I'm coming home. Um, and there was just, you know, I didn't know back in those days that the only place I really felt safe and secure was in my own home. And so to be traveling to in other countries and yeah. oftentimes being on my own uh, just created so much uncertainty for me. Um, so I had this conversation with somebody uh, a few months ago yeah. and she was like, you too? She's like, I thought you were the only one. Um, and so now I go to airports and I've done a lot of work with my therapist and I can go to airports and I can just pick up on the anxious energy and I look the other way and I smile and, uh, and I, and I have no problem traveling these days, but it's little things like that, that interrupt your daily pattern, right? That you think, wow, this is kind of strange. Those are the things that you need to probe deeper. Because if it happens once and it happens twice and it, it's a repetitive pattern, then there's definitely something underlying that that needs to get addressed. And it's always better to speak up about it and talk about it and seek help for it early rather than allowing it to go down this really long and you know spiraling path. Um, because the climb out is often harder and much longer, like you were saying earlier. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I think the the release of the need to be in isolation is what's key from what yeah. I'm hearing you say, right? Oh, totally. Yeah. None of us should be suffering in silence or alone. We must heal, heal in community. Like you were saying even before when you said, I would just tell Amy or other people that voicing and exercising of your voice to say, I am in distress is part of the healing process instead yes. of us being expected to do it in silence or bear it. That's yeah. old school, right? We're, we're around the same age. I think I'm a little older than you. Yeah. You're but, a year older, but yeah. same age. <laughs> <laughs> and our generation is the grin and bear it. Yes. Grin and bear it. Right. Yes. And I'll be all, true talk when TikTok came out and people are all talking about their feelings. I, my first reaction was, why? Why yeah. are you talking about like we we made it this far? We're fine. And then <laughs> then I realized, yeah. no, oh, no, 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 no. We actually have to speak about it. We yeah. Speak and you're about it. Yep. You're right. And and therein lies where the name of the pod, my podcast came from, yeah. because you just said, yeah, we were the generation who we grinned and we bared it. And what were we doing? We were surviving, however that looks. And it looks different to each person, but we were surviving. The difference is now lots of people in our generation are starting to break that cycle of silence. And I'm seeing it more and more with the younger generations now with our generation, you know, hopefully taking the lead 
and realizing that by speaking about it, we can move to this space where we become thrivers. Now, when I say thriving, I don't mean every day is rainbows and unicorns and glitter. What I mean is we've now realized that there is something off and I need to speak about it and I need to get help and I need to change the trajectory of how I'm living my life. That to me is the arc of going from surviving to thriving. Uh, and you know, it's, it's, as you said, it's, it's a hard thing to do. And it's really, 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 really hard to have that first conversation or to tell somebody for that first time. And I remember even for me, and, and this is another myth that I want to shatter right now is I always felt, well, I'm going to be a burden, uh, if I tell somebody and, and it, it's, it couldn't be any further from the truth, right? If we have a physical issue, physical ailment, we tell somebody and we go to the doctor and we get it addressed and we get it fixed. We're not a burden. <laughs> and the same thing when it comes to our mental health. And, and I, from my own lived experience for your audience, I can tell you that the longer that you let it go and the longer you try to hide it, that it actually becomes a burden. It becomes a burden on you and your path to healing starts from kind of a deeper place and takes longer. And so it can, it can be more challenging for you and others around you. So my message, speak up and speak out. <laughs> it gets better. <laughs> you do not have to live each and every day, um, you know, in your current state. I love that. And and I think it's like, it's just amazing. I can sense that's one of the reasons why you started your podcast in the first place, Eric. Real talk in t terms of even healthcare, not everyone had access to it, right? We can't no. always go to the doctor unless it's a true emergency. And then you'll have to worry about the bill later. Podcasts like Dance to Heal and Survivor to Thriver, we exist to help you just here, it's okay to speak of these symptoms of things that are actually not unique to your own suffering. There is a community of people. We're just taking one breath at a time together. Yes, you're so right. And you use the word helping people. And from day one of the podcast, it was all about helping other people. It, I'm not going to lie. And I'm sure it's the same for you. Every conversation I have, it helps me heal a little bit. I hear somebody else's story. I hear, yes, there's one more person just like me out there. And this community of those of us who are have struggled and have found ways to move through it is growing. But it's all about helping people through storytelling. And, you know, having all these amazing guests on over the last three years, hearing their stories, hearing what they've come through, and then knowing that our audience is able to listen to that and connect with this real relatable person who is just like them, has a, has a normal life just like them. They wake up every day, they go to work, they, they have kids, they, you know, um, that's, that, that's the essence of, of what the show is all about and why I love coming on shows like yours, because I know it's, you know, it's not about um, just making money and marketing and all these kinds of things. It's about doing something to help other people, you know, so that we can build this community together. Yes. Yes. When you were speaking, Eric, immediately brought up in my mind's eye, there's an Instagram account, by the name of Humans of New York, H-O-N-Y, that went viral because this photographer went around taking pictures of people and then telling their story. He had this superpower of, of people who just spill stuff to him. He wouldn't ask them pointed questions. They would just talk about some random thing that just, they were inspired and they gave him permission to speak about. And then from there, it escalated into fundraising for war-torn countries that he would travel to. Look it up. I, I'm a part of their Patreon okay. account because I just wanted to 
to support this amazing photographer. He did it out of all donations. And then he started fundraising for businesses that were struggling. And then they would bring in business to this business that was struggling, stuff like that. I just think it's amazing because audience members who are listening or watching the YouTube understand you make such a difference in your immediate circle of influence. I didn't start healing until I realized, oh my gosh, if I'm not present, I can't keep my children safe. One of my kids was in extreme distress, meaning self-harm, sorry about the trigger for some of our listeners, and also making decisions and choices of not wanting to be around in this lifetime anymore. And it wasn't only until I realized I'm not present enough to keep my child safe, that that's when I started on my journey. So a lot of us, we're motivated not so much by ourselves as by the people we can help around us. And those of us who who need that motivation understand the more in community you are with other people like Eric and myself and your immediate community, the more of an impact you're having. And then you can see how important you are, that you need to be in your bodies and understanding that part of your healing is going to heal other people. Ah, so beautifully said. And people just want to be heard. There are so many people out there, as you just said, who have a story to tell. And they just want to be heard. And you don't, to your to your audience, like you don't have to be in the public sphere like Jenny and I, you don't have to have a podcast. You ha- you don't have to have written books. You don't have to have, you know, half a million followers on Instagram to make an impact in your community. Just your ability to reach out to one person. You will never know the impact you have had on that person's life. And just like you made that decision, Jenny, for yourself, um, you know, for the importance of, you know, being able to not only help you be present, but to be able to help one of your children who is struggling. Um, you know, I, I think back to a story, uh, of a, of a good friend of mine. And just recently I found out, uh, I, this person was struggling a couple of years ago and I happened to be out mountain biking that day here in Snowmass. And, you know, n- nothing is a coincidence. And I, I ran into the person who I see all the time. And we started having a conversation and they were telling me, you know, I'm not doing well, this and that. And I just, I was there. I was there to listen. And we just, we just talked through it. And um, I, I rode off. And uh, about a week ago, that person who I see a lot, (laughs) is a very good friend of mine, admitted to me that the day that I rode up to them, they had already made a decision that at the end of the workday, they were going to go home and trigger warning, um, they had made a plan to take their own life. And because of that conversation that I had, it interrupted their thought pattern just long enough and um and so it's it's conversations like that and you may never know i didn't know until last week you will or may never know the impact that you've had on somebody's life and it's just from having that one-on-one conversation and giving people some space to be able to finally be heard oh i got chills from you telling that story eric when when this person told me uh you know, last week I got chills because I, I knew there was some struggling happening and, but I had no idea. And then I started to think to myself, if I hadn't ridden that trail that day and I hadn't come upon this person, like outside at their place of work, how the course of my life and the course of this person's life would have been changed forever. So, Yeah, there are no coincidences out there at all. 
there really isn't. We're all actually so connected and energetically more ways than we're even acknowledging or able to prove in science yet. They're starting to show the connections. And I just want to remind the audience there's there there's a catchphrase help one person every day hope that is what i wish for you listening and watching eric and i i know that this is something that we do we just focus on that one person we can help whenever i would perform it's you okay so there's a little nervousness right before you take the stage that's just a reality because mm -hmm. we care yeah. right we care about the performance and the and the important thing is what you just said jenny there's a difference between nervousness and anxiety and nervousness and panic exactly Exactly. And nervousness is that sense of like, it's kind of a little excitement. It's a little butterflies. Mm -hmm. But once you get out there, everything goes, it all goes away. Yes. Once you get out there, for me, it's always been the priming myself to be a conduit so that it's not about me. It's about the audience members. Who is that one person in the audience waiting for me to get up on the stage so they feel less alone? And I would ask you to do that for yourself. And it doesn't even have to be people. I foster kittens. I've sa saved hundreds of kittens' lives because I really, really felt the need to pour into them. Some of these kittens are like, I don't want to be alive. I'm like, no, you have no choice. I'm going <laughs> to You have energy, no choice now. <laughs> and you're going to fluff up and you're going to go to a loving family for whatever time you've got left on this earth because yeah. not on my watch, right? So yes. who who is not on your watch in your life that you need to be there for? And in order to be there for, here's a caveat, right? Eric and I have talked about being really clear and present in yourself so that you know, if I need help, I'm not gonna hesitate. I'm gonna immediately ask for help. And sometimes, quite frankly, some people aren't ready for you to say, I wanna change, right? And you will just keep talking until you get the help. Does that make sense? The squeaky wheel gets oiled. Say it once and you're like, oh, well, no one paid attention. I ask you, say it twice, three times, four times until you get help. It is essential. That's gonna be your empowerment because when you're learning to speak for yourself, you will learn to speak for others. So, so, so true. It's, and it, it reminds me of an analogy I use a lot uh, when it comes to getting help, right? And mm -hmm. unfortunately, and you and I have talked about this and we talked a little at the beginning of the show where good Professional help is not necessarily available, accessible, and affordable for everyone when they need it. And my hope, your hope, I know, like we can change that. We can do things to change that. There are so many stories of people that I've heard who have gone to a therapist. And for some reason or another, they haven't felt a connection to that therapist. And so they throw up their hands and say, well, therapy doesn't work for me. And my message is it's like now you and I have met our significant others <laughs> back in our college days. So we were very lucky. We didn't go through the online dating world. I feel as though finding a therapist can often be like online dating. There's someone out there who you will connect with. Mm -hmm. If it doesn't work on the first try, don't give up. Yeah. Try again. Ask somebody, ask a friend. You know, one of the things I love is this conversation is now happening with people around, I have this therapist or I see this therapist, they're really good. Or I'm, I have this uh, coach or this person's uh, my energy healer. And so people are starting to trade that type of information as the same way they did with like, oh, this is my primary care physician. So don't give up. Don't give up. There are so many therapists now who not only uh, go under the umbrella of, you know, uh, psychotherapy or psychiatrist, but they specialize in certain things. So the therapist I'm working with now, she's amazing with PTSD. And so we look at like trauma-informed care. And rather than addressing it as general anxiety or general obsessive compulsive disorder, we look at it 
from the umbrella of PTSD. And these are the symptoms that are being presented. And so why are those symptoms being presented? And so we do a lot of work to, to look at what is it underlying that's programmed in our brain, my brain, that creates these things. And so we can then like gardening, we can go out with a shovel, we can dig it up by the roots, right? And we can clear the yard and we'll end up growing a really nice lawn rather than kind of just ripping things out on the surface and addressing the symptom as it appears. But the roots get deeper and deeper and deeper. And so, uh, you know, I would just say, you know, to follow what, what Jenny was saying, like, you know, speak up, speak up, speak up, speak up and and don't give up with one therapist or another therapist or there are thousands of different combinations of treatment modalities that work for each individual person. And, um, you know, it'll take a little bit of time. I, it has for me to be able to figure out which ones those are. But when you find them and you're able to put them together and get them to work in harmony with each other, it gets a whole lot easier each time you sort of go down, you know, one of these journeys, the journey gets, it, the the time period gets a little bit shorter, it gets a little bit easier. And before you know it, you're kind of on your way and, and moving to uh, moving to a better version of your former self, as I like to call it. Yes, yes. And I and I would be so excited to add returning to the you before the world got to you, because that's the key. We come into yes. the world as these precious light beings, right? And then part of our our experience and what we elected to do in this lifetime is to experience life as humans. And then sometimes we forget why we came because these things that happened and we don't remember anymore, they actually affected us and we just have to acknowledge it. I've been seeing a complex PTSD specialist because I never acknowledge the really stressful childhood I had, really truly, because I wasn't allowed to and to be given permission to explore that. There's even research that has come out that if you have this healthcare team, this healing team. Healing team. Right, the healing team. I not only have complex PTSD specialist, I have energy specialists. And because what I do, which is coaching under the framework with using evolved neurolinguistic programming and somatic movement, that helps me really figure out what's going on. My daughter, the one who was having all those difficulties, she was homeschooled by, by me, never went to school, was an elite athlete. And you would think, what kind of, trauma could she have gone through? And it was only after we went to see the therapist who never put this in her head. She came up with this after working with this therapist for two years because she was going through the self-harm that it was from, trigger warning, S-A um, from a, a grandparent. And we did not realize that. And I thought back, oh, is that why at three years old, my twins said they did not want to be babysat anymore by these particular people. And I could not figure out why. And they weren't evolved in their brains to say what happened. They just said, oh, we don't like the way they make us play. And that's all we said. And I, and I know they were very actually controlling people. So I was like, oh, all right, well, I don't want you to be with people who don't let you play the way you play because that was one of my parenting decisions. I wanted them to play however mm -hmm. they want to play, not realizing it was her child language of saying they didn't feel safe with them. For mm -hmm. good reason. Yep. Right? And it's amazing. It just takes, it, it, people think that when we talk about trauma, it has to be this giant letter T, right? It doesn't always present itself like that. There can be a big T, there can be a series of small T's, right? The, however, it stacks up, it stacks up for people. And yes. it sounds yes. like in your daughter's case, right? There's one experience. Tea. Was a, it was, a big, it was a big T. It was a big T. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It was a big T that then, right, kind of went on unaddressed. We and didn't I'm know. You didn't we know. Thought yeah. That they and weren't safe sure, with their grandparents, right? And I'm sure over time, there were other little T's that it created. And so you have a big T and all these little T's, and they're all, right? And so that kind of an outcome is not surprising. Exactly. 
And so what I wanted to have you audience understand that is it is okay in your healing journey with your healing community and team that has you address the outer layers of what you think is initially. It's okay as you dive deeper to find maybe some other things you weren't even aware of. And that's part of your healing journey. So what's the best way for them to get in touch with you, Eric, besides your Survivor to Thriver podcast? Sure. So the best way to reach me is via our website, which is also called From Survivor to Thriver. Uh, it has links to our podcast. It has links to uh, Scars to Stars, which was a compilation book that I was part of uh, that came out in was September of this past year 2023 uh, you can uh there's ways to reach us directly through uh through our email on the website if you want to be a guest if you want to share a story with us if uh if you just want to be able to chat and there are links to all of my social channels on there i will tell you my instagram personal instagram is kind of fun it's at ski sherpa uh has a lot to do with um one, the job that I did for 12 years uh, as a ski instructor here in, in Colorado, but also it was a nickname bestowed by my in-laws uh, who had been coming to this very particular place that we live uh, for you know a few decades. Uh, and once I started skiing at the ripe old age of 33... <laughs> Uh, so yeah, coming up almost on my uh, 20th anniversary of, of skiing and I just took it upon myself to go determine where are we going to go and what runs or whatever. And so over time, they just called me the Sherpa. And when I tell you they can't find their way around the mountain anymore, uh, it's, it's kind of funny. So one of the, uh, I guess one of the good things about, you know, having OCD, so I could say, is having a photographic memory. <laughs> and, uh, and so I have that ability to visualize, I can go to a new resort, I can see the trail map, and I kind of know exactly where I'm going. So yeah, if uh, hit me up on at Ski Sherpa, there's lots of fun things, uh, ski wise, mountain bike wise, and mental health wise on there as well. Oh, I love that. So you have a plethora of things to explore with Eric. All the things. Remember, yeah, all the things, right? So remember, you can also start the somatic movement movement with me at danceandheal.com. Don't forget to look up Eric on his podcast and his website, and we will see you next time. Thanks so much for coming, Eric. Thank you so much for having me. Hi. Thanks for listening to Dance to Heal with Jenny C. Cohen. Come back next time to hear stories of recovery through movement and learn more ways that you can move your body. To work with me and continue your journey, visit OutsideInRecovery.com. Are you ready to move?